Thank you very much, Marlene. Um, good to have all of you here. So the talk today is based on the white paper, uh, uh, recently completed on governance. The paper is pretty long, uh, probably longer than ideal. Uh, uh, today, I tried to present it at a fairly high level, so it should be done in half an hour or so. There's some time for questions in the end. Um, and if um, something kind of I, th I think you think I've missed, then feel free to email, af email me afterwards at the aristovatstream.com. So let me share my screen. Let's see uh, if this works. Okay. Can you still see it? Yeah? Yes, it's working. All oh, right, okay, good. Okay, so as, as for introduction, governance is something we governance of the network. It's going to take us a while before we actually get things done on that front, but uh, we'll get there. Now, when we started to think of governance, we pretty soon realized that the kind of relevant background research is kind of lacking. There's some good research and lots of kind of debates out there, but it's perhaps not easily available in uh, one place. So we thought that the thing to do is to write this up ourselves. And one thing to be clear is that this is a kind of survey of governance, morals, and the relevant issues. So it's not a paper on streamer governance. That will be another topic to come back to uh, later. And the paper is available uh, um, as a kind of permalink. Uh, there's a blog post as an intro to this on streamer blog and also on SS. Uh, RN. So that's that's <laughs> where you can find a bit more detail on that. Let's move on to kind of define what we think of as, as governance. So the use of institutions, decision making processes for resource allocation, coordination, and dispute uh, resolution. And what we do here is we focus on governance of the infrastructure, not on governance by the infrastructure. So that would be that would be different. And the term, of course, itself is uh, fairly old, comes from uh, Greece, meaning us to steer a boat or ship with, with a uh, with a handle. Uh, so, so, and let me just okay. Also, while we are getting started to define what is a decentralized network, so we see, see that as a system composed of several nodes. Each node is capable of computation, um, and the nodes constitute a network, which is typically peer-to-peer -peer or P2P network. Important thing, of course, is that the nodes act on local information in order to achieve um, global goals. There's no central decision maker in there. Um, in this work, we kind of try to place decentralized governance in a wider context and in history. And we think it's useful to get us, give us some perspective on what's, what works, what doesn't work, and what are the important issues. And in a way, you can view history as a long series of practical experiments on governance, and there's valuable lessons in there. Now, of course, there wasn't much need for governance when people lived in small groups in kind of pre-historical times. But then later on, with the development of agriculture and people settling down to um, cities, organized societies, what you see is that the um, typically political institutions tend to develop. By the time there's about five to 10,000 people in the same place or city or settlement. It seems like when you put that many people, uh, you cannot really maintain a society without some sort of functional governance. Now, I won't go through all of the things listed on that slide. Um, the, maybe except just to kind of mention a couple of points. You kind of know on the private sector how firms work and even why they exist. 
There also has been uh, some interesting experimentation on kind of self self organizing structures like holacracy and sociocracy and so forth. The first one, of course, in the US, and more the second one on, on the European side. Then there's interesting things happening on the kind of a uh, open source sector. And as an example, and there's kind of, kind of two extremes in there. The cathedral style, in a way, is where the core group develops the code and external contributions are um, discouraged. And the bazaar style, in the other end, is something where the public is encouraged to contribute early on and the code is uh, made available uh, kind of as soon as it's uh, ready in some, some version. But there's lots more detail on, on those in the uh, white paper and references to kind of the original sources. Um, so I won't spend more time on that for now. Is it, is it enough time today for those? In decentralized networks, then the um, obvious question is kind of that the um, if governance can be at all similar to what we find in the wider society or will any of those structures still work or do we um, need something completely new um, uh, based maybe on code or chain uh, or if that's not necessary or and so, so forth so that's questions do emerge um, then but to maybe just have a brief look at what actually is being done on governance in the crypto space. I think in the early days uh, you had something which might be called like a benevolent dictatorship and Ethereum is a good example of that. But things have, be, have actually moved on since those early days. Um, so what's a fairly common model of course is uh, technocracy at the moment. So what that means is that you've got a small, smallish group of core developers while the final decision makers on protocol changes and parameters. In practice, of course, they, they will need to kind of consider views from the uh, uh, community and token holders and exchanges and uh, wallet providers and so forth. But what's interesting is that there's usually well-defined process like uh, improvement proposals in different protocols and how those are kind of debated and discussed and decided. Um, then there is a kind of version, if you will, of a uh, representative democracy or kind of delegated democracy as, as well. But what happens in, the, in practice, I think, is that they often kind of they, uh, um, are closer to like a plutocracy where those with the, uh, more tokens, they get to make the decisions. And that's of course, that uh, because you've got a kind of proof of stake or delegated proof of stake uh, consensus mechanisms and you need tokens to be part of part of that. Um, private governance is also fairly common, like in many cases, the projects are kind of uh, managed or coordinated by private companies or maybe foundations. In some cases, like permission blockchains, you've got uh, consortiums and there's of course well-defined governance on, on those. Um, maybe to elaborate a little bit on the delegated uh, democracy or proof of stake because I think that's important. Um, in a way that's a kind of well accepted interesting governance model where you can delegate your decision making powers to a proxy and there's also an interesting subset of that liquid democracy, where the difference is that uh, in there, if I delegate my vote to you, then I get to see your choice before votes are counted. And if I'm happy with what you've done, then that choice stands. But if I'm not happy, then I still have time to vote directly. But that's not really, I think, how things work in this space. So in what is uh, like delegated proof of stake is often again a, a plutocracy and there's a kind of symbiotic financial relationship there 
because token holders choose a smaller number of nodes as delegates as the tokens and then each time a new block is due one of the delegates is chosen at random to create the block and the node receives a transaction fee as a reward and part of that reward is shared with those who voted for that delegate so let's think of what happens there it's kind of similar or analog in politics to um, you could think of as say like members of parliament we are given individual taxing powers which are proportional to the number of votes they got and then those uh, members of parliament would then hand back some of their ta the taxes to people who voted for them and keep the rest so it's maybe not quite what you would want in a democracy so effectively what's that ha what's What's happening there is a kind of form of patronage. Of course, the same grace in there is that the rules for that are open and coded in the blockchain. And that's actually uh, then called a programmatic distribution, and it is actually um, deemed legal, at least in the US, by the Supreme Court. Otherwise, it would be called something called clientelism, and that would be illegal in most countries. Then Moving on, there's a new model called uh, Futarki, which was proposed uh, about 20 years ago by Robert Hans Robin Hanson. And that's an interesting model where the community first defines its values in terms of concrete metrics. And the prediction market is then used to decide which policy is likely to best achieve the outcome. There's, of course, uh, potential weaknesses in there, but it's interesting and it's something I think some protocols like a uh, Bezos and Gnosis are experimenting at the moment. So let's move on to what are the kind of key issues. Um, again, there's many different models in governance over time, and I think it's useful to try to figure out what's the key differences between those models and if you can kind of find those. We'll also know what are the kind of important things when we want to design a new governance model. So one of the obvious questions is that who gets to participate in the decision making process? And there's of course many candidates, token holders, uh, financiers, um, node operators, service providers, developers, network users, content producers and application developers. And that's kind of too, too many. So you want some filtering in, in there. And of course, you cannot really expect to have influence if you don't have a financial stake or some other legitimate interest in the system. Also, many of the issues for governance will be technical and non-trivial. So you need to be kind of motivated, informed before you can usefully take part. And also let's trim, remember that there's a transaction cost to governance in terms of time and attention. So you can make the case that routine decisions are best taken by a small group of informed, qualified people, those directly involved, like developers. And of, there's also, of course, external stakeholders who will try to influence the process. Uh, in politics, you would have kind of lobbies, think tanks, parties and media and so forth. In the crypto space, there's, there's a, a wider community and stakeholders, like exchanges and all providers and, and uh, so on. So another important issue I think is that what actually is, is governed. And there's many kind of different dimensions to that, like technical issues like direction of the code base, uh, param parameters in there. Network itself may be public, may be closed, but if it is permissioned, then the question is who decides and how, who gets to um, uh, take part. As an example of ethical issues, you can think of the rights and responsibilities of the network users. Privacy is another important dimension. Are the stakeholders identified? Can they remain anonymous? Will the user need to reveal their identity before they can participate or access the network? And 
content should be kind of free for all, should be moderated. Some of that might be illegal. Again, what's the process for that? Who gets to decide what's acceptable? And what's the decision making process for spending, distribution of revenue? How do you fund R&D initiatives? And finally, if the governance model itself needs to change, what's the process for that? Moving on, one, I think, important, perhaps surprising lesson in the history is that the, it's rather important to have a well-defined structure in place. If you think back to 1960s, it was a time when the women's liberation movement got started. There was a student at Berkeley in, in, in the US, Joe Freeman, who was active in that movement. And what she realized is that if there is no st structure, what you will get is an inner circle which calls the shots. So the elite will start inventing informal uh, sp unspoken rules of the game. They may have good intentions to start with, but the abuse of power becomes a real possibility. So power is there, but without explicit governance structure, the power is simply disguised. And she wrote a kind of interesting, well-known essay on this called The Tyranny, Tyranny of Structurelessness. And if you Google her name, it's not difficult to find. Another lesson in history is that uncontested power easily leads to bad things. As a remedy, it's prudent to have different seats of power in the system so they can act as a check on one another. And these ideas were formalized, of course, by Baron de Montesquieu in the end of the 18th century. In trias politica, as is well known, the branches of government are the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. So in a way, I think Montesquieu was an early proponent of decentralized governance. Of course, this space is very different from a nation state, but I think the principle has kind of proven useful over time. And something similar would be good to have in place in decentralized networks. Um, the, again, as discussed, the structure loses the meaning, again, you need to have some structure and people kind of need to know what that is. So the rules of governance have to be transparent, common knowledge. In the nation states, you've got laws and regulations. In the society, you might have things like social norms, which are maybe unspoken. But there's usually a fundamental law called a constitution, or it may be called a charter in a corporation, or it may go by some other name. But um, the, there's nothing to say that you cannot have a constitution in a decentralized system, and I think it would be a good thing to have. The nice thing about constitutions is that there's no need to start from scratch. Lots of thinking has been spent on uh, the principles since the kind of ancient uh, Greeks. And the separation of powers is one such principle, and there are others. Like for instance, uh, usually what you do is uh, what you do is you spell out the ideals, goals of the community, and this in this crypto space, the ideas might include values such as privacy, transparency, democracy, and of course the specifics will depend on the project. A good constitution makes governance predictable, and a part of that is that there's explicit powers limits on the powers of the leaders and the governing bodies. You can also include a bill of rights to protect the community members. That would be what you would call a justice element. And of course, you should, be, should, be, should define the supreme power which has the final say. Um, now, a fact of life, I believe, is that there's going to be conflict between different stakeholders. And that's why you need some mechanism for dispute resolution. And if there's no good means to kind of resolve conflicts, some part of the community may you know, effectively revolt. Threat of forking is a powerful check on, on poor governance. Okay, so that's just to kind of summarize what we've already said. Now, one question on governance, if it 
is centralized or decentralized or something in between. And there's good arguments for decentralized governance, such as uh, diversity, maybe faster reaction to um, issues for local actors and, and kind of uh, legitimacy. But it's good to keep an open, open mind because decentralization is not always the answer. It may kind of lead to loss of economies, economies of scale or slower decision making. It's kind of a trade-off in there between decentralization and efficiency. But in practice, again, the morals will usually not be in either extreme. Now it can be rather difficult, I think, to assess or measure the degree of centralization. And that's because, for one thing, there's many dimensions to that. It's like the uh, mining activity, contributions to the code base, the trading activity, like token ownership, and also like the geographic distribution of the nodes in the network. And that's interesting an important problem in its own right. There's things you can do, like the, um, uh, you could, for instance, calculate the uh, Gini coefficient over the relevant dimensions and then take some aggregate of those. And there's in fact something called a Nakamoto index, um, which would be the maximum number of entities, so the minimum number of entities, which is sufficient to compromise the system and Satoshi index is the kind of normalized version of that. And there's other, other things you can do, like techniques you can borrow from graph theory or the analysis of social networks. And that's kind of more like a theoretical question because there's some immediate, well, or soon immediate practical importance on that. Like in the US, there was a recent proposal by the SEC, like a four, three year safe harbor for crypto projects as long as they are sufficiently decentralized. So the measurement then becomes the key. Now as it is, there's not that many empirical studies on this uh, topic. Uh, and that's probably because good data is hard to find. There's some tools like the um, Aletheo Etherscan, which can help, and some good work by consensus on the Ethereum. Uh, Moving on, uh, there's new tools. Technology brings kind of new possibilities for governance. You've got, of course, smart contracts in Ethereum and other blockchains, which can automatically execute almost any computation. And there's things like the uh, DAOs and uh, uh, token curated registries of DCRs. And with those, you can implement kind of various decision processes in computer code, have them execute automatically and you, what you get is effectively on-chain on governance. Uh, on DAOs, uh, as an aside, there's an interesting question of who actually owns a DAO. So when you create a DAO, tokens may be issued and token holders may have some influence on how a DAO works, but usually, unless the tokens are kind of created by STO or something like that, they, don't, they, do, they do not give the token owners an illegal claim of ownership. So who owns that thing? Or does a DAO own itself? I think it's an open, interesting question. And in any case, though, we should be kind of realistic. Uh, what can be done on chain and what needs to be done off chain? Like usually DAO cannot really stand alone. It will need external services whom it may be provided by decentralized apps or community members or kind of software developers, other professionals or third parties. An implementation of any decision will usually require some off-chain uh, action. Now in software development, of course, the code base may go through dozens of changes every day. So deciding every kind of small matter through a DAO or on-chain is just simply not practical. So on-chain governance doesn't remove the need for human interaction. And also uh, any on-chain model uh, is um, incomplete. Like any, any kind of formal decision rules, there's always going to be states of, states of nature which are not covered. And also how do you kind of settle claims in code if there's valid arguments based on ethics or natural justice? 
Uh, and I think something important, I believe, is that there's a kind of decoupling, like the um, degree of decentralization and degree of human involvement, which is like on-chain against off-chain. They are two different dimensions. So decentralization does not imply on-chain or vice, vice versa. And again, off-chain is not the same as uh, centralization. So with the DAO, like, uh, you can implement pretty much any government governance model regardless of how centralized or decentralized it might be. Okay, so coordination, I think it's an uh, important part of governance. So you need co cooperation, coordination to avoid conflict, resolve uh, disputes and coordinate the efforts. And there will be different views in the community and there will be different preferences. So you need some sort of mechanism to aggregate those preferences and to allocate resources. Um, again, coordination is relatively easy to in small groups and you can kind of, uh, you know each other, you can uh, interact face to face. Uh, so if you can have a small group of developers, core group, you can always just talk to each other. And try to reach a consensus and there may be of course there often is uh, different form of steps in that process like bitcoin improvement proposals are the same in ethereum in, or in other blockchains and of course those are kind of modeled after earlier uh, earlier uh, similar processes like python improvement proposals um, but then again coming back to uh, token curated registries. It's an interesting on-chain mechanism. Essentially a decentralized application which can be used to maintain dynamic high quality lists. And there's many potential use cases in there. So that's like as, such as quality assessment or content or identification and selection of new features. But if you look at the uh, TCR, uh, what you, you will see pretty quickly is that it's effectively a game and it can be analyzed therefore like with game theoretic tools. Now what you may get is a kind of Keynesian duty context where those players or participants who can best predict the other's choices up to the nth degree, they win. But the outcome may, out, may turn out to be like a focal point or shelling point. So it may not necessarily be the optimal choice for the community. So it's, you need some a little bit deeper analysis to understand how those actually work in the particular case. Voting, of course, is another well-known method for aggregating preferences. Now, we usually associate voting with democracy, but it can be equally well used in a autocracy or oligarchy. It's simply a method, I think, to arrive at the decision hasn't really got much value in itself. Um, there's many ways to organize a vote. You can have equal weighted voting, weighted voting based on some, some quantitative criteria, score voting, and there's quadratic voting where you, the first vote is, uh, costs you one token, second four, and third nine tokens and so forth. Kind of a uh, immediate case between the um, equal weighted voting and the uh, autocracy. And of course, the parameters such as quorum, the basis, uh, and who is allowed to vote, they can make a big difference to the outcome. And um, kind of unfortunately, rationality can be lost when you use voting to aggregate preferences. There's a uh, theoretical results like arrows impossibility theorem and others which kind of show that the, uh, any reasonable voting mechanism is either dictatorial or subject to tactical voting. So it's not ideal uh, mechanism either. Um, then uh, again, uh, voting in the past is, is usually of course off chain. I think it's gonna be different when you vote remotely or electronically like you, you would usually do in crypto space and that's again there's the kind of risk in there's a greater potential for fraud like the safety measures you would use in the physical world do not easily carry over to online voting 
So like with weak encryption or software box, software box uh, manipulation of results is can be easier and can be done on a massive scale. So you cannot do things like easily check voters' identity or use kind of voting booths for privacy or have neutral observers to monitor the votes. So kind of technical issues in there won't go too deep into those, but you'll need uh, verifiability, confidentiality. Cryptography can help there. Um, so um, thing, through things like mixed networks, homo homomorphic encryption, uh, by signatures and so forth. And self-sovereign identity can be used to prevent civil attacks. But even then, if you think of like, dele like delegated systems voting in those, there's kind of other risks in there. Like if you've got a cartel of block producers, they may decide to call you out, um, to blacklist accounts, which threaten, threaten their positions uh, and profits. Or you can have a coalition of nodes who can vote for another. Or as has actually happened, is that if you've got one or two whales, they can um, kind of dictate the decisions, especially if, the, if there's not too many voters taking part. And that is a practical problem because so far the kind of a, uh, voter participation has been fairly low, often um, or typically less than 10% of token holders kind of bother to turn up and vote. Um, so kind of moving towards conclusion and, and, and the questions, just to kind of as a brief recap, again, the motivation behind this white paper is the uh, our view that good governance is critical for long-term viability of decentralized uh, networks. And if you, are thinking, if you are thinking ahead to the next stage of governance or deciding the governance model, it's good to be aware of the previous research. And there's several useful lessons in the history of governance. Again, some structure is needed. If there, are, if there are no institutions and no transparency, those in the inner circle are easily tempted to use the system to their own advantage. Separation of powers is useful as a safeguard against misbehavior. And again, in nation states, trias, trias politica has stood, stood the test of time. Concept may not carry over as such uh, to this space, but it's still, still useful, I think, to have distinct seats of power. The constitution is a good device for spelling out what's the underlying principles and for defining the processes, rights and obligations. Um, one uh, practical thing is that there is a transaction cost to governance in terms of time, effort, focus, and the, and the kind of uh, right level of decision making depends on the nature of the decisions. Um, informed debate, community participations, and the kind of fairness are important for kind of uh, legitimacy uh, and coordination. The consensus um, seeking works well in smaller groups, but uh, so you can use kind of forums or mailing lists or face-to-face -face meetings. But if you've, got, if you've got bigger groups and you cannot really come together, then voting is often the only practical alternative. And conflict between different stakeholders is pretty much unavoidable. So a good governance model provides a framework for resolving disputes peacefully. Um, also, I think that before you kind of design, finalize any governance model, it's good to kind of get to know what the community thinks. As an example, there was a governance survey in Ethereum last year. It would be, would be good to have similar surveys in other protocols. In the long term, uh, I think that the decentralized network can only be sustained if there is an incentive compatible structure in place. So one aim of governance can be to create a model where the participants contribute to common goals, even when they act in their own interests. And of course, there's different kinds of interests. 
like social incentives for contributors, but also economic incentive for the network users uh, and participants. And what works today may not work in the future. There's going to be innovations and you will need different business models or adapt what you have. So a good governance will allow the network to adapt when the, when the environment changes. And again, as discussed, there are interesting new tools like DAOs, DCRs, and so forth. But I don't think we should confuse a governance model with the implementation. Again, so the decentralized network can have off-chain governance, and a non-blockchain system can have off so the new tools are again simply they are tools and they don't solve any of the underlying issues by themselves so i think i've spoken enough so there's much more to all of these issues i've just tried to raise a couple of points which are important but uh, there's lots more on those on the white paper and you're free to reach out afterwards by email or other channels so Marlene, I think there's time now for questions. Maybe you would like to. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, so thank you everyone for tuning in. We would like to start the Q&A now. And I can already see that a couple of you started asking questions in the chat. Um, so maybe let's just start with the first one from um, Birgit. And um, she is asking, how do you view governance versus time and development? do see or have experience in the changing model of governance for blockchain or DLT environments? Okay. Well, I, I think I can answer only on this stream or coming from a streamer viewpoint. The, I think one important point, at least for us, is that it takes time to do this properly, right? So we don't want to put in place something which is kind of uh, half-baked or doesn't really work. I want to take the community views into account. So we are starting to think about this. Um, and that's, again, one of the motivations why we've written this white paper. And I, I should give credit to other team members uh, and people who've commented on earlier versions of that um, on, on their contributions. But we want to get more views. And that will all take time. And we want to can experiment with what we are doing here uh, before we kind of put anything new in place on governance. And again, on streamer projects, we are making good progress on the kind of technical roadmap, but that will still take time. So we are kind of trying to start early on governance uh, because it, that will take uh, easily uh, a year or more before we've got something in, in place. I don't know if that helps. That's, that's our thinking. OK, then um, let's move to the next question. Um, can you see the chat too, Risto? I think I Otherwise, I'll can. Yeah, yeah, I can. Okay. Yes, OK. So maybe let's take the question from uh, Maria Sabona. Um, she's saying, thanks for this, Risto. Two questions. First, the problem of power concentrations in large tech large tech is due to they incorporate most of the stakeholders that you identify so it's their business models that is non-governable by other actors um, so maybe we first want to answer this one. Oh, okay that's a um, involved deep question so let me have a thing um, okay I think one distinction to make is that if you've got say lots of concentration of power, um, and again, that may be because of it's a private and permission blockchain, or maybe a consortium blockchain. And um, there, if there's kind of a, uh, it's, if it's coming from the corporate world and there's substantial financial backing, backing behind that, then you would expect that the, those who provide the finances would kind of main, retain most of the power. So I'm not sure you can claim them there. Maybe I misunderstood the question, but if that's that's what happens, then that I think that, that would be one aspect of that. Um, then 
and again, if I'm, if I misunderstood, then maybe ping me later on that. Second, do you want to read the second part, Marlene? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so the second part is, and by the way, uh, Maria Savona is one of our data union advisors, I've been just told. Um, so the second part of her question is, what do you think of this idea of bottom-up data trust that is going ahead in many debates? What are your views on that? Okay, like data trusts, data unions, which is something very interesting. Um, and I think there's two layers on that. Um, there's the kind of contributors of the data and then there's the kind of blockchain or the platform where that data is collected and maybe distributed. If you think of the second one, which again might be a streamer network or might be something different, then, then it's a governance for that network. And again, that, then we come back to like what we and maybe others are trying to do, this takes time. And if it's a data union or data trust and the governance of that, then I'm kind of again, personally positively inclined, supportive of the idea that the, those who provide data should have some say on the governance. But again, and certainly they ought to be able to kind of decide on their privacy and things like that. Um, so I would encourage that, but then I understand also that if it's somebody's business, like if the third party in a data union uh, spends time, resources, money and efforts on setting up the data collection and the data union, they will want to kind of get compensated for that, right? And have an influence of where that thing is, is going. So there's two sides of the coin, so I'm not sure I can answer even that one perfectly. I think it depends very much on particular data union and who is who is set it up, who is contributing the data and the effort on that. So that's my quick take. All right. Um, now we have more of a historical question from Usita and they are asking why do you think the Soviet Union is an unsuccessful political structure given that it lasted well over 60 years? Ah, okay. So first of all, I'm I'm glad to see that you've read the paper. <laughs> paper. <laughs> so, um, the, the 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 okay. Again, this is a personal view, not a company view. Um, and coming from like a, a different society myself, um, the. I think that in the end, Soviet Union has proved unsustainable. The ideas, like communist ideas, um, again, they are ideals. And even though they are interesting and maybe in a way something you might want to happen, I, I don't think they take into account how people actually behave, right? So they didn't actually work out that well in their reasons. Soviet Union eventually collapsed. And the other point is that I don't think it ever was a truly communist society either. It was always in a transition, again, in my, my view, and it never got to the where, what was the original intention either. But again, that's, that's politics and that's, that's very personal. So you, you, may, you may disagree on that. All right, let's move to the next question from Nikke. Um, he is asking, what do you, what you see the most attainable tools to create the first version implementation for governance, the MVP, so to speak? Okay, that's quite an interesting one, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can only, only at the moment, I think, to mention some of the tools, which I think already are mentioned, right? Um, and maybe some, maybe some structures. I think it's impo more important to start with the structures, right? Like what are the kind of governing bodies? Is there some separation of power? And what are the different seats of power, right? Then once those are kind of figured out, then how do you select like representatives to those bodies? Because you cannot really have direct democracy 
if in, in any kind of large scale system these days. So you need processes on that. Uh, uh, how do you do that kind of representation? And then there's, uh, there are tools uh, which are again useful and interesting like DAOs, uh, uh, curated registries, which can be part of that. And again, how do you put all of those together? That again, we will need to spend time analysis on that. But again, to summarize, I will start with the uh, with the structures uh, and and the kind of a uh, uh, high, bigger bigger picture, and then see where you can simplify things, implement things in a secure way, in a decentralized way, as far as possible with those new tools. So that's the best I can say for now. All right, um, then maybe let's move to the question at the very bottom from P. Fulrich. Um, he is saying, brilliant presentation, Risto. Thank you very much for this. Please find below two questions. Um, so the first one is, how to increase community participation as well as their activity in voting? Okay. The, I think, first of all, um, it's, again, useful to have discussion, debate, information sharing in the channels. So I think it starts from that front, like the core team, project, should aim to kind of share as much information, try to get as much feedback as possible in the existing channels, just to kind of a, uh, engage people, have them take part in discussions. So I think that's the kind of the first thing. Then the, how do you actually make them take part? Now, again, I think something I discussed in the white paper on my, on my you know, personal views is that the system or the community or the technology has got to be interesting and useful enough that people are motivated to take part. And again, analog in, in politics is, is, or civil society is that uh, you don't pay people to vote in elections, right? And if you do that, it kind of then defeats, defeats a purpose in, in my view. So in a way, it's the participation or in a way, if the system is not useful enough so that people want to participate to some extent, then you should kind of all go home, right? <laughs> to be brought uh, on that. Um, the, and I don't think you can force people to vote either. I think you do that in, in some, some countries and it works to some extent. I believe like in uh, New Zealand, perhaps, some kind of socialist, countries, Cuba and so forth, but I'm not sure how useful that is in the end. And I'm not sure if you would want to pay people to vote, but it's, it's an option and it's, it's up to, I think, for discussion. And I wouldn't close the door to that either. There's things which have been tried, I think, and are proposed, like the like if you are using your tokens in staking or in some other ways, then the more recent use gets rewarded with more uh, powers or more governance rights. So maybe that's a good compromise to think of as one possible technique. All right, um, then we have another question from Maria. She's asking, um, if you have time, Risto, what is your view on the potential role of data unions in the context of debate on the implementation of contact tracing apps to tackle COVID? Um, and how do you ensure a benchmark level of trust to create incentives to communities to participate? Okay, that's a very interesting idea. Um, and I think it might be a very useful idea in this current uh, uh, current uh, present time. So I, I think there's lots of potential in there. Um, I know that outside data unions, there are some in some countries already uh, apps, mobile apps to do that, I, I believe. I think maybe in, in UK and in, at least in Finland, I think. 
but to have data unions to, for kind of wider participation, I think it's something which could be very, very useful. Uh, and it does take some work, of course. So somebody's got to kind of roll up their sleeves, <laughs> uh, move up, move on that. But I think it could be a very positive development. And, and the trust, of course, is that in a way has to be built into the data union and privacy and things like that. I think important part of that is that the decentralization is one of the keys in there. I, I think in many countries, maybe in Germany, the apps do work in a decentralized way that the data is not shared with any centralized uh, kind of repository. And I think that's important and because that's built into the data unions. I think that, that that's a good, good thing there. All right, um, then we have a question from Georgios. He's saying, uh, thank you, Risto. Do you think we shall see in the near future decentralized governance company goes public with shareholders voting in real time? Oh, okay. I would like to see that. Um, and let me just think, maybe what one of the very few good things about this uh, corona situation is that the uh, it will be difficult for some time to have lots of people in one place, right? So you can either have proxy votes or you could have like decentralized governance. So maybe that would speed up, speed that up a little bit and I would be interested to see if that's happening. And again, maybe I must admit my ignorance on that. There's probably uh, experimentation on that front, but I haven't seen that yet in any wide use, but it would be good to have, and maybe with, it will now happen sooner than later. That definitely sounds really futuristic, but also interesting. <laughs> um, another question from Osita, who's asking, I appreciate your insight and taking the time to make this presentation. Could you give a bit of breakdown on your idea for decentralization in the infrastructure and decentralization for the infrastructure? Uh, maybe I've I misspelled that uh, in the presentation. What I meant to say is governance, uh, the uh, of the infrastructure, not governance by the infrastructure. Anyway, what I meant in, in there that what this white paper is, is about is, is not the same as a consensus mechanism, right? So it's about deciding what what are the kind of structures and processes it, you might want to use governance to decide what is a consensus mechanism but uh, I've written this paper not from the viewpoint that consensus is governance because I, I don't think it is right so it it can be the case that those who take part in consensus maybe because they've got the place at stake they get some some say some powers uh, to influence things, but it's not it's not governance. That's what I tried to say there. Um, all right, then let's take one last question again from uh, Birgit, and um, she is asking the question is slightly more above because um, wait, let me just find the question. Um, how do you balance? The governance in this environment where so many people uh so many tech people are involved in the initial phase um and i messaged her privately again to kind of get more insight on her question how she means it and she wrote me that yes indeed is what she means is that in time the stakeholder group um is going to be more varied but in the beginning it's just this one small group so how do you make sure that the governance is correct in that phase Oh, okay. Is that in, in the chat? I don't um, If you scroll up a little bit, um, it starts with one more question, have you time? How do you balance off the governance in this environment where so many tech people are involved in the ah, Okay, okay, fine, I understand. Got it. The, okay, yeah. No, I, I think it's a, it's a good, good question. And, uh, and it kind of admits the reality because these are very technical 
initiatives, technical projects. So they are mostly, or in many cases, found, kind of set up, founded by very technical people. And, and I think you need to get beyond that. So, and if you don't, then uh, what you have is not going to get any kind of widespread adoption. And I, I hope that the uh, people who have set up these projects realize, and I think many of them do, that it's time to move on. At some point, you need to let go, um, and and you know, in a way, put place something which is uh, has got wider uh, participation from non-tech people. Also, it's important to think of the tools. Like if you need to kind of set up with a mask and things like that, or uh, things that which are not really kind of feasible for many uh, non-technical people, you need to get beyond that. So it's something I think it's got to be done, but it's got to kind of start from the core people who who will, in a way, um, invite or put in place a wider governance structure. All right. Um, yeah, it's already 11 now. I think uh, it's time to wrap it up. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, if you're interested in learning more, the white paper Risto authored is also available on our website, and um, we can also share it again through social media, um, so you can find it there. Um, yeah, have all a nice day, and thank you so much again for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Be safe.